Good morning, Newtown. Thank you for joining us for worship today again. Our call to worship today comes from 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 to 13. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power, and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name.
sing You are life, you are life In you death has lost its sting And now I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms The riches of your Jonah chapter 1 verses 1 through 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Avatari. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Hello, everybody. This week, we are beginning a new study on the Old Testament book of Jonah. I actually preached on Jonah as my first sermon series when I came to the Reformed Church of Newtown over seven years ago, if any of you can remember that far back. Yet, when I thought about doing Jonah, I didn't want to repeat myself. 
So as I discerned about whether to use Jonah and other books of the scriptures that uh, would be relevant to our struggles and what we're all going through right now, Jonah just kept coming back. And so I wanted us to take a fresh look at this amazing book over the next weeks. Throughout this small book, one of the themes is about a life interrupted. As we will study, Jonah was a very established prophet in Jerusalem. When God gave him this call that just totally interrupted his life, his life was interrupted by circumstances that he couldn't control. It was interrupted by calls for societal change that brought up divisions and his own prejudices and denial. His life was interrupted by struggles to his own faith and changes in his work and also by depression and frustration, lethargy, sin, and anger. And I wonder if any of those themes are familiar to us um, in this time that we're going through. Because like Jonah, we are also living through circumstances that we can't control in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are also living in the midst of societal changes that bring up divisions among us and bring up prejudices, bring up uh, denial. We are also living in the midst of struggles with faith and changes in work and also frustration, depression, lethargy, sin, anger, and a host of other things. So in the midst of all that, we see that though Jonah was written 3,000 years ago, it is still a very contemporary book. So as we begin our study of Jonah, one key to understanding this book that the church has utilized throughout the centuries is to see yourself in Jonah. To see your plight in Jonah's plight or Jonah's plight in, in your plight. And also to see your relationship with God in the way that God related to Jonah. The famous preacher and teacher Lloyd John Ogilvie wrote that to know Jonah is to love him. And the reason we love him is because he is so much like us in our response to God. So as we begin our study, we're going to look at just the first three verses of the book of Jonah. And these are introductory verses that help us get to know Jonah, but also help us get to know our plight and our hope through Jonah as well. We are specifically going to look at three challenges that Jonah faced in the midst of his life interruption, and that also we face in the midst of our life interruptions as well. The first is to not just believe, but to trust. The second is to live out our calling, and the third is to be aware of our sin. And as we study these challenges, we will firstly look at Jonah's failure to meet these challenges in the midst of his life interruptions. But through his inability to face these challenges faithfully, we see the faithfulness of God. The main theme of Jonah is God's pursuing grace in the midst of life inter life's interruptions, in the midst of disruptions, in the midst of failure and brokenness and struggles. And so beneath every passage in Jonah is this theme of God's pursuing Jonah. As Jonah hides, God pursues. As Jonah rebels, God loves. As Jonah runs, God runs faster. So throughout the book, I encourage you in the midst of these challenges, as we might find ourselves knowing that we always don't meet these challenges with faith, to see the, the theme beneath uh, all of this, which is God's pursuing love, which helps us then step towards faithfulness as well. So we begin by studying the first challenge when life interrupts that Jonah faced and we also face, and that is to not just believe in God when life interrupts, but to be drawn to active trust. Now we read in our passage that Jonah was someone who had no problem believing God. And we see this in the very first verse in the book. The first words of this book are, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. And the phrase, the word of the Lord, was actually a technical Hebrew phrase in ancient literature that referred to a prophet. A prophet was someone who received words from the Lord. You know, we might hear the still small voice of the Lord in various ways in our lives, but the prophet receives the word of the Lord like a bullhorn, a direct one-way communication from God to the person that is crystal clear. 
And that's who Jonah was. Jonah was one of just a few people chosen in a generation by God to uh, share God's messages of judgment and mercy to his people. You know, I just mentioned that we're to see ourselves in Jonah, and this is one of the ways that Jonah is very different from us, because he was set apart for this special task. And also we read through the scriptures that Jonah was a national hero because of his ability to hear God's voice. In 2 Kings, Jonah prophesied um, that the Assyrians were going to invade Jerusalem. So, that, uh, so the um, Israelites needed to strengthen the walls of Jerusalem. And the king of Israel heard Jonah's prophecy and did what Jonah said, and the nation was saved. So at the, the time of this story, Jonah was really at the pinnacle of his influence and fame. He was at the very top of his game. He would have been very wealthy. He would have been the spiritual counselor to the rich and famous. So belief was not a problem for Jonah. But trusting God was. I've mentioned before that there are three aspects of faith in God. There is firstly agreement. That is the first step towards faith in God, where we just simply go, yeah, God could be real. Jesus could be real. The Holy Spirit could be real. All of this could be true. And then the second step is belief of going, it is true. I believe it. But then there's always a third step to, to uh, faithfulness as well, and that is trust. Saying, I'm not just going to believe it, but I'm going to take the leap. I'm going to trust. I'm going to depend on God. I'm going to look to God for wisdom. I'm going to follow God's ways, no matter the cost. And we see that Jonah had no problem with the first two aspects of faith. He agreed with God. He believed in God. But he had a hard time trusting God when life interrupted. And this is really a message for, for those who believe in God. This is not a message for atheists. Jonah did not lose his faith. Even at the worst times of his rebellion and running from God, he believed in God. <laughs> so we see here this warning that in the midst of believing in God, we can still not trust God. And that's really the warning of, of Jonah's uh, story is that we can believe and not trust. And that's a challenge for us as well. I think a challenge for me often in my life is I don't have a problem believing. I've, I've reconciled my belief with God a long time ago. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe in the Holy Spirit. But I often am, am brought to the knowledge that I'm not trusting God. You know, something occurs that makes me frustrated or angry. And I realize that my anger uh, is coming out in ways that are, are showing that I don't really trust God's ways. I don't want to put down my anger. I don't want to resolve it. Or, you know, I see something big in the world and I just become hopeless. I, 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 I just wonder, is God really out there? What is God doing? And I lose trust that in God's character, that God is good, that he's merciful, that he is incarnate in Jesus Christ and he is working in the world, still renewing all things. And so in those times, I think all of us have those moments where we realize that we're not trusting, even though we're believing. We are challenged just to return. The first step in just trusting is practicing trust. Is just saying, I am going to look at this situation through a lens of trust rather than a lens of cynicism or frustration or hopelessness. I'm going to choose to look at the situation in a different way. And that is how we cultivate trust. Trust is not something that comes naturally in faith. It is something that is built, something that is grown like, like a garden, you know, uh, a garden does not grow healthy and strong by you just looking at it. <laughs> you have to water it. You have to tend it. You have to, uh, to plant and to sow all these things. The same thing with trust. And so we learn that in life's interruptions, we firstly are challenged not just to believe, but to trust. And then also connected with this is we are challenged to continue to live out our calling in the midst of life's interruptions. Our calling as Christians is to, to love Christ to serve Christ, to go where Christ goes in the world, to receive grace and give grace. And the calling of Jonah in this passage is also very clear. Jonah in verse 2 was given the call from God. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. 
And this was a very clear calling from God. I mean, I think many of us in our lives and ministries would love to have such a clear calling from God. Like, okay, I know where I'm going in my life. I know what I'm supposed to do. But for Jonah, it had the opposite effect. It really turned his world upside down and it caused him to immediately try to get as far away from God and his calling as he could. And this call was so disruptive to his life because firstly, it, it disrupted Jonah's understanding of his job. As I mentioned, Jonah was a prophet, and the prophet's job was to hear God's messages and share them with God's people. And occasionally, God would give messages of judgment to foreign nations. But rarely were prophets called to go to those nations to give the prophecy. Most of the time, prophets were you know, they stayed in Jerusalem behind the, the massive walls, safe and secure as they shared their uh, words of judgment to foreign nations. But now Jonah was called to go to Nineveh 600 miles away, which back then would have been a long way. That would have been a world away. And so Jonah's whole idea of his, of his job, of his calling, of who he is, was disrupted by this. God shouldn't do this. Why is God calling me to do this? And so we see that it disrupted his understanding of his job, but it also kind of uh, disrupted him because it, it was the sense of endangering his safety as well. Nineveh at the time was one of the most powerful cities in the world. And it was known for its greatness. It was, you know, one of the wonders of the ancient world. Yet it was also known for its cruelty and heartlessness. It was also kind of the sin city of the day. You know, sex, drugs, and whatever form of rock and roll existed uh, at that time was what Nineveh was known for. So Nineveh represented everything that the Israelites despised. It represented a way of life that Israel just found intolerable. But also Nineveh was the stuff of the nightmare, uh, was the stuff of nightmares for the Israelites as well. For hundreds of years, the Ninevites had raided um, Israel. They had destroyed cities and towns. They had taken whole, you know, uh, communities into slavery. You know, the Ninevites were what were kind of spoken in, um, you know, uh, scary stories at night uh, around the campfire. They were the stuff of nightmares. And so from Jonah's perspective, what God was doing in sending Jonah to Nineveh was giving him a death sentence. He would have wondered, what does God hate me? What, what is God doing in sending me to this place? And so his, uh, he was disrupted by the change in job and also his safety, but also we see his calling was disrupted by his own prejudices as well. Even if Jonah wasn't killed when he got to the gates of Nineveh, he would have had to preach God's words to people he hated. Whether God's words were judgment or encouragement or mercy, they were still God's words. They were precious and holy. They were like a jewel, you know, like a, a precious metal. And so Jonah was being asked to give God's precious words, this precious and priceless thing to people who were wicked and who hurt his people, people he likely despised and wanted to see wiped from the earth. So we see how those three factors really work to disrupt Jonah's calling. And they really also disrupt our calling as Christians as well. When life interrupts, we see this clash of understandings about the Christian life at, and, um, and what God is calling us to do in our life. You know, we may have fallen into the rut when things were okay or just calm of thinking that the Christian life was kind of about going to church and, you know, maybe some Christian fellowship, maybe going to a Bible study here and there you know, and being a good person. But then God interrupts and says, forgive your enemy. Love those who persecute you. God tells us, forgive as I forgave, not just as you can forgive. God says, be obedient to my way. God says, live by grace. Seek and follow and receive Christ, no matter what that costs you. And that is disruptive to our lives. That, that is a conflict in our lives. And at the same time, God interrupts often our safety and comfort. God sometimes calls us to go to dangerous places, and God always calls us at times out of our comfort zone. Now, 
you know, when we see missionaries or others going into dangerous places, we might go, well, that's foolish. And so always we need to think about the wisdom of that. But there are many times throughout church history and even in our modern days that God has called people to go in places that they knew that it, things could turn out very badly for the glory of Christ and the cause of Christ. And so God does call us into dangerous places at times, but God always calls us out of our comfort zones. God calls us not to just be comfortable, but to seek him, which leads us to take risks at times, leads us even to try and fail for his good and for the glory of, of God. And so we see that our desire to be comfortable and our desire to be stable can put us in conflict at times with God's word and God's will for our life. And lastly, we see that like Jonah, we can be interrupted by our prejudices, dislikes of others, and hatred. And this is often a greater stumbling block than we realize. A few weeks ago when we um, studied about forgiveness, we read Jesus's words that basically said, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. And the, the meaning of that was that by our lack of forgiveness, by our attitude that will not forgive, we then take on the traits of the unforgiven. We do not receive the grace of Christ. We do not live in the love of Christ. We do not receive the joy of uh, new life in our life because we will not forgive. We become stunted in our faith. And that can happen for us as well, like it happened for Jonah. And that happens with the people who are close to us, but it also happens with the other the person out there. And that was Jonah's problem. Nineveh was the, the hated other out there. The person, they had, he had probably never met a Ninevite. 600 miles was a long way away um, at that time. So he had probably never had a conversation with a Ninevite. He only had his hatred, his anger, um, his prejudice towards them. And that led him to despise them even from afar. It also led him to run from God's call. So we see that those disruptions um, to his call led him to run away, to flee his family, his homeland, his security, all to just get away from this calling. <laughs> and this highlights the third challenge in the midst of interruptions in our life, to be aware of our sin. We read in verse 3 that Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. He went to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. And notice the detail in this passage. The writer of the text wants to make sure that we are very clear about the lengths that Jonah would take to get away from God and to get away from his calling. Tarshish, scholars think, was somewhere in Spain. And Nineveh was... Uh, probably close to Mosul in Iraq. So we see that um, Jonah went the exact opposite way that God was calling, thinking about the farthest port, the farthest way to get away, just the, the you know farthest destination. That's what he chose. So Jonah went the exact opposite way that God called him. And this exposes the definition of sin that we see throughout this whole book. The book of Jonah never says the word sin. But this definition of sin is all throughout the story. And that is that sin is running willfully and purposely from God. It is a willful and purposeful fleeing from God. So Jonah was not running out of fear. He wasn't afraid of God. He knew God. He, under, he knew God better than any of us are, would hope to know God in our life. He heard from God directly. He didn't run from God out of ignorance you know, he didn't run from uh, God for any other reason. He purposely and willfully fled from God because he didn't want to do what God said. He thought his will was better than God's will. That his personal judgment was better than God's judgment. His way was the best way. He insisted on doing things his way and that his way was better than God's way. So that is really the definition of sin that we see throughout this book. This willful and purposeful running from God. 
And we see clearly throughout the book that Jonah was never fully aware of the sin. He never fully got it. There were glimmers, as we'll see throughout the book. But at the end of this book, we see that Jonah was still miserable, still thinking that he knew uh, better than God, that his way was better than God's way. And his unawareness gives us a warning about our unawareness of sin as well. If you notice, this kind of definition of sin can be, can be uh, kind of engaged in in the, mid, in the middle of a very religious life. Jonah, you know, didn't do any of the, the very outward sins that we would say, oh, that's such a bad thing. He wasn't like the prodigal. He didn't party his way, you know, to destitution and spend all his money. And, and you know, he didn't do those things. He was a very religious, upright person. You know, if he were around today, he would be the pastor of a mega church or the leader of a very, you know, well-known Christian organization. He would be out in the public. People would look up to this man. But even in the middle of of a very religious, outwardly looking, very good life. He had this inward problem, this sin beneath the sin. That was this insisting on his own way. Not trusting God's judgment, but thinking that his judgment was better than God's. And also we can be unaware of that kind of sin in our life. In the midst of a very good life, midst of you know, being a good Christian in doing all the things we should do, we can engage in this kind of sin and also just not fully understand it. Because this happens on often a thought level. It happens, you know, in our motivation level as we're thinking, as we are kind of uh, just living out our lives. And I don't think any of us would say, my will is better than God's will. <laughs> None of us would say that outwardly. None of us would say, I am willfully and purposefully running from God. But we do it in little ways. You know, we do it with our time. Every time we say, oh, I just don't have time to spend with God. Oh, yeah, it'd be good. But, you know, I'm so busy. That is saying, I know better than God. I don't need God. I don't need his word. I definitely don't need his wisdom in my life. I don't need to cry out in prayer. My time is is better spent on other things. We say that, we, we make that statement in, in little choices we make. You know, if we're um, dating someone and we go, yeah, should I have sex or not? Well, yeah, why not? That's saying, well, I know better than God's way. God's plan for marriage is, you know, that two people would come together in this, in this bond of trust and sex then is uh, a way to encourage that intimacy. But no, yeah, I know better than God's ways. We do that in so many small and large ways. And we can just not be aware of it in our life. So the challenge really is to, to be aware that even though we look good outwardly, that privately our thoughts and actions may show that kind of hardness and, and running from God. For this reason, one of my old professors in seminary, Chap Clark, used to say, have you taken a whiff of the cesspool of your sin lately? <laughs> And I think for us city dwellers, we might go, well, I don't quite get that. Um, we don't have cesspools in our apartments most of the time. A cesspool is just a hole or a container that, that holds excrement. It's usually pretty smelly. You know, you have my cabins, um, uh, other places like that. And so when we think about our sin, often we might try to minimize our sin, try to hide our sin, try to, to make it less pungent as it is. But Chap Clark, Chap Clark's... Uh, Suggestion is a good one for us. Just regularly to take a whiff of the cesspool of this, our sin. Just to take a whiff of how gross and misguided and destructive it is to build an identity ap apart from God. To s insist on our way rather than God's way. And if we're honest with ourselves, we re we'll realize that our sin doesn't smell so good. That's why we try to avoid it and not talk about it because it just doesn't smell so good. So when we, we take a whiff of that sin, we're going to agree with Paul. We're going to say, like Paul said in Romans, wretched person that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? But then we also have the opportunity to say the second uh, phrase in that passage. But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul understood Jonah's type of running from God. Paul was a very good person. He was 
a leader, a young leader, one of the up and rising stars in uh, the Pharisaic movement. And as he came to Christ, he also realized his sin, his brokenness, those little ways, not the big ways. Outwardly, he looked, he looked perfect. He was one of the best people you know. But he realized those inward ways that he was running from God. Those ways that he was saying, my way is better than God's way. I will do what I want, not what God's want. And that led him then to the remedy, which is Jesus Christ. That is the blessing of us. When we take a, a whiff at the cesspool of our sin, it is not a shameful moment. It is a joyful moment because it leads us to grace. It leads us to God's goodness. Thanks be to God in Jesus Christ. We see that Jesus is the remedy. He is the cure of our shared rebellion. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who takes away the sin of the world and gives us grace. So as we are aware of sin, we are also aware of grace. As we run from God, we can only see uh, ourselves. But as we run to God, we see his amazing grace and love. So I encourage you, uh, as we continue to have our lives interrupted in various ways, to just seek to uh, trust, and not just believe, but trust. To seek to live out your calling as a Christian in the midst of these hard times and challenges and changes we're all facing. And also to be aware of your sin, the ways that you willfully and, and purposefully run from God. And as you do that, I also encourage you not to be discouraged when you fail at it. Because we receive from Jonah the message that we will not do this perfectly, that we will fail, that we will stumble, that we will fall. And so we see for Jonah then that if that was the only narrative, if that was the only story, his morality, if it was his righteousness that won the day, then this story would be over at verse 3. I mean, at the end of verse 3, we see that he had lost everything. He was on a, on a, on a boat, you know, away from everything he had, his wealth, his position, his, the respect of the people around him, uh, his, his, his God. But we see that verse 3 is not the end of the story because God had a plan for him. God was not finished with him. And that is always the truth of us as well. God is not finished with us yet. It is by no sparkling morality or faith that moves mountains that we receive God's love. It is the one-way love from God given freely in Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to see the hope in the midst of the challenges. In the midst of life's interruptions, we are challenged to walk in faith, but we can only walk in faith as we receive grace. No matter the depths that you have fallen into, no matter the, the inward um, rebellion that you might be engaged in, no matter the, the, just the hardness you feel or just the distance you feel from God, always we see that the hope is that God loves us more than we can imagine. And that's not based on what we have done, but only on his love. So let that be an encouragement then to walk in faith, to take a step in the midst of life's interruptions. God bless you. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you that in the midst of life's interruptions that you are far more present than we realize. As the psalmist said in Psalm 139, even though we say the darkness is complete around us, the darkness is not darkness to you. The darkness is as noonday sun, because darkness is as light to you. So we see that in the darkness of these interruptions and disruptions to our lives, and especially as we are facing the cesspool of our own sin, that you are far more present than we realize. Help us to receive that so that we can be faithful in these times of interruption, that we can not just believe you, but trust you, that we can hold to our calling as Christians to love you and to love others, that we can um, also be aware of our sins so we can go in grace. We thank you, Lord God. We give you all the praise and glory for you are good. In your son's name we pray. Amen. And amen.
praise streams of mercy never ceasing calls for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above praise the mountain fixed upon it mounts of Safely to arrive at home. Jesus saw me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. As we close, just want to share a few announcements in the life of our church. Firstly, on August 2nd, we are going to be celebrating communion together. Over these past months, as we've been apart, uh, we have not been celebrating the Lord's Supper. Uh, yet, the leadership of the church has been, has been discussing and praying and discerning about whether to practice the Lord's Supper, even though we are practicing it separately in our homes, to practice it as a spirit of unity where I will lead us in uh, the celebration of that sacrament. So we decided to start on August 2nd because we still uh, are most likely going to be having at least partially live streaming um, services or online services for the next few months. And so um, there are instructions about how to do that in the bulletin. Uh, I know you might be wondering, well, how do we do that together? Basically, you will buy some bread and you will have a cup of juice and then um, I will lead us in the liturgy and then together we will take it like we do at church. So be looking forward to that. And also um, the encouragement is to uh, prepare before the service. So you don't want to be caught at, you know, uh, 1220 going, oh, what do I have in the house to celebrate communion? Uh, you want to think about it. So there is a guide to how to approach that in your bulletin. And we'll be giving more information about that in the next few weeks. Also, uh, we are recruiting for our youth and college group. 
Uh, as many of you know, we uh, Simone Louis, our new Youth and College Director, has been working hard since June, and so we are at the point of now looking for people to uh, relationally uh, care for our students and also share the gospel through your words and your deeds. Uh, you don't need any prior experience, just a desire to uh, get to know our students and also a desire just to be an example of Christian love to them. So if you want more information, check your bulletin and contact our youth director, Simone. Also, if you're looking for ways to uh, serve in this time, there are two food pantries happening, one uh, at Newtown at the end of July, and then one at St. James, which is across the street. I know serving in this time can be a little bit you know, hard because we don't wanna to be too close to each other, wanna keep social distancing, wearing masks and things like that. And at both of those food pantries, that will happen. Um, there will be social distancing and um, safety precautions as well. But it's just a way for us to serve our community because so many people, as we know, are just in need of, of food basic necessities. So if you can help on with that, uh, please check the bulletin and contact and get involved with those. Also, if you yourself are in need, uh, we have a fund, the COVID-19 Relief Fund, that is for people involved in the English congregation who are experiencing financial need because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is a way for us to be the church to each other. As the church, we are called in the scriptures to be joyful when others are joyful, to mourn when others are mourned, and to help each other in times of need. So if you're experiencing financial need, I encourage you just to uh, go to uh, the link that is in your bulletin, and uh, one of our deacons will contact you, and will just pray and discern with you about your needs and how possibly the church might be able to assist you. And also, uh, at the end of July, there is going to be a celebration of work and vocation. We're going to be having a special uh, session on a Friday night that is uh, going to have a panel of people from different um, industries and um, work, kinds of work, and they're just going to talk about how faith connects with their work and how they see God calling them uh, to be a faithful witness and to be a kingdom example in the midst of what they're doing. So I encourage you to be a part of that. There'll be more information coming soon, um, and also just check on your bulletin uh, for a link as well. And now, friends, uh, as we go, receive this benediction and be encouraged in Christ. God, go before you to lead you. God, go behind you to protect you. God, go beneath you to support you. God, go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. May the blessing of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be upon you. Do not be afraid. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen and amen.